Hello everybody and welcome to this little interview. Uh, I've potted over to Chepstow in Wales at a top secret location uh, and home of James Walker here of TI22 Vehicle Services. James, how long have you been going? Uh, into our 11th year now. Okay. Yeah. So uh, James is a Rupes, I've got to blow his trumpet because he won't, but James <laughs> is a proper uh, well, is a Rupes trainer. He is an IDA certified trainer. Yep. Um, you have got accreditations coming out of your ears. We can't go through all of it because my memory cards won't last, but you've had a lot of experience with lots of different ceramic products, lots of different uh, general detailing products, um, and of training people uh, around the country. Yeah, more latterly. Yeah, definitely. So, like yourself, been in and around the industry a long time, and I think you, once you've got an established, certainly for a detailer, once you've got an established detailing business, so, well, yeah, certainly for me, you want, I, I, yeah, we come at this, I think, the same thing from two different angles. I want to get involved in the training and accreditation side because um, I want people to get the right information. You know, mm. we, we've just done, swapped, swapped we uh, our do, interview yeah. around. And, you, and you've said, you know, we, we're talking a lot about getting information from, like, approved sources. Yeah, and, vetted, vetted sources. Vetted yeah. sources. And there are, every man and his dog is offering training. Um, and it's one of the truest things in, in training, you know, if, if you can't teach, you know, if you, yes. if, if, you know, and I, I have got a successful detailing business and, and we'll, we'll continue from that. And I think somebody with a successful detailing business is the best person to, to learn detailing from. They've got a proven record. Yeah. Um, so I've gone out and got some accreditations, the biggest accreditations I think you could get, which are to be a certified Rupert's trainer, which there are only um, two of in the UK. Mm -hmm. Me and Mr. Medcraft. Hello! Hello. Um, and also the IDA um, accredited trainer. Uh, there's only three of us in Europe. Um, so, and, and I think those organisations are beyond reproach in their sort of rubber stamping of, of people. So, um, I want to give quality information and be known as a source of quality information rather than part of the norms. You know. So that's come from a career progression point of view, that's where James has chosen and James gets on with people very good. I've seen, I've actually been to a Rupert's training day with James, in fact we interviewed Jason Rose and Alan at that day and so I've sat in a chair with James talking at me with a PowerPoint presentation and I was pretty riveted to be honest. I mean, I'm Didn't fall asleep or anything? No, not at all. I had a lot of coffee though. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. But um, what I wanted to talk about today uh, really was PPF because it's something in very much in the detailing sphere, should we say, um, and it's gone through a progression. So about four or five years ago, lots of higher end detailers were buying all the kit, buying all the plotters and all the, all the things, doing the training courses, um, and quite a lot of them have now backed away from it, and some even, we were talking earlier, have come back into it. Yeah, yeah, I um, understand. And um, PPF is paint protection film, so it's a thin-ish, um, clear plastic layer that you put onto a car. Geekily and relatively speaking, it's actually really thick. Um, so just to frame that, yeah. Um, back when we started detailing, so we talk a lot on the training course about paint thickness. Mm -hmm. So the old paint systems, because it's changed the modern paint on, I could bore you about that for hours, but paint on cars is getting a lot thinner because accountants don't like rooms and rooms of cars drying around because it's millions and millions of work in progress. And lots of kilograms on cars that reduce fuel efficiency and all that. No, no, it's, no. Very, it's much more to do with capital employed during the production process. So if you imagine rooms and rooms and rooms of paint drying mm -hmm. of cars, if you can knock a day off that, you're improving your capital employed by tens of millions. Um, the, so, on average, let's say the paint thickness on a car is 80 to 100 micron. Okay, so that's including the base, the colour coat? Yeah, and the, yeah. And the primer, it, it, primer, colour layer, clear coat, all those layers together are 80 to 100 microns, give or take. Mm -hmm. If it's a brand new Mazda, it might be as low as 60, if it's a brand new Ferrari, it might be as much as 200, but 80 to 100, give or take. Um, a ceramic coating is maybe one or two mm -hmm. thick. So PPF, uh, Xbel is slightly, so the two leading PPFs are Xbel and Lumar. Lumar is slightly thinner, it's about 180 microns, mm -hmm. so getting on for twice the thickness of paint is what we're talking about. So Xbel is slightly thicker again than that, so 7 mils if you're American, so about 200, 210. My conversion is not really good. Xbel is the slightly thicker one, but gotcha. to, to, to feel them, 
you wouldn't really notice, but they are twice the thickness of paint. So, relatively speaking, really, relatively speaking, really thick. Thick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, so we've had that, that progression where people are getting into it, and then some kind of backed out because I don't think the market was ever flooded, but I think it was originally a bit of a cash cow because we've had there are companies like Paint have been around for years and years doing really good work. I think the thing we've seen is like you know, it, it's in many ways it's comparable to a ceramic coating. It's a, a very, um, it's grown a lot. Mm. So back in the days when there was maybe two guys, Venture Shield and, and, and this sort of stuff, all these old products, there was a market for it, most noticeably on Porsches, it was what we call the um, wing shield. Yes. So any cars with a wide rear arch just had a little scratch guard and it was really old stuff that was even thick, I think it was like twice as thick as the stuff we've got now. It was a solvent based adhesive. So commonly on white cars it would go yellow after two or three years yeah, and that absolutely. was because that solvent adhesive would turn it yellow. So the big change has been in the films. In the last three or four years the films are unrecognisable mm -hmm. to, to those old school films. And at the same time the, the market has gone through the roof. So probably fuelled by the classic car market and the overs market on the new collectible cars so your gt porsches your limited edition ferraris uh, those types of cars obviously a lot of the intrinsic value is in the original paint yes so if you can if you want to drive and use those cars why not put a really thick effectively plastic shield over it that's virtually mm -hmm. invisible that relative to the value of the car is cheap mm -hmm and then you've got the original paint underneath and therefore the original value of the car. So I think that's why that market has exploded. Absolutely, I think, yeah, people taking more care about their, the higher-end cars for preservation is, is absolutely key because it is quite expensive. I mean, we've got this McLaren, which is a 570S by the way. Yes. Obviously, without giving away confidential information, if you were to own a car similar size to this yep. and they came to a good, recognisable PPF installer, yep. what sort of area are they going to be paying for the PPF component and the relative preparation? Because obviously, you need to do a bit of work beforehand. So this is publicly available, this mm -hmm. information. So the people who are really good at this are experts. Mm -hmm. So you can go on to Expel's website, uh, click on your car, click what kits are available and they've got a price straight away there. So the, the big cost with PPF is the cost of the actual film, mm -hmm. which is based on square footage, which is how they calculate that because there's then a recommended install cost. So it's in dollars because they're American, yeah. but that question is easy to be answered and it's pretty much conveyable straight into the exchange rate, it's not amazing anyway. but it. Pretty much, and the other reason I mention Expel is because I know I'm not an Expel recommended installer, but I know they are very keen on the network and that the network has a common pricing structure. Gotcha. So, which is similar to other new car protection, you know, like ceramics and stuff like that. Some of the yeah, systems. Yeah, absolutely. But it's 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 good because it's built around the fact that if you go to three different installers, the price should be broadly similar. Gotcha. Um, so average on a on a car like this, you you should be paying. 1500 quid ish so if you are go to one of the top approved installers you'll probably be a little bit more than that maybe like 1800 plus VAT. Is that for front only or for the whole car? Yeah it's no front only. Front, front only. only. So front only you might you know there'll be some nuances so it may or may not include mirrors and the size of the car will vary mm -hmm. massively but your average size sports car 1500 quid ish for a front end so it's not not 500 quid and not five grand it, okay. it, it will change so. but again if you had the whole car done and it was a bigger car you could you yeah could but again plus, you know. think think um probably between four and a half and six thousand for a full car yeah but if you imagine so ferrari 488 pista yes um you know our most of these cars are a third of a million now so, well, so relative value, it's actually relative value sense. is tiny. Yeah. Um, and you know, you, you know, the from a value preservation, all of these cars will go up in value. So, uh, a few years ago, when the top sort of mid-engine Ferrari was a four five eight, yeah. so four five eight Speciale, four five eight Speciale Aperta came out. Even if let's go crazy and say you spent eight grand on full PPF and detailing and did all the things we love doing, like pulling the wheels off brand new cars and protecting everything and stuff like that. You know, those cars, depending on options, were probably 280 to 300 new, mm -hmm. but the overs market for two or three years afterwards was getting on for double. So 
there was a time when they were trading for half a mil. Mm. So you want to keep the original paint. So there's so, a real commercial benefit in it. We've established the, what, what it is. And, and it's massively protective PPF. Mm. So if it, it will easily resist key scratches. I've had people drive their cars, uh, you know, the wing mirrors have hit the side of the garage as they've gone out. Mm -hmm. No damage. I've heard of stuff falling off trucks on motorways and hitting bonnets, dented the bonnet underneath. But, you know, rather than then, so imagine that is a, a very collectible Porsche with it. You want to keep the original paint. So in that scenario, if it then goes to Porsche and gets repainted, it's no longer original. It can only be original once. With PPF, the PPF protected from the abrasion, mm -hmm. paintless dent repair to pop the dent back out. The car is then back as brand new. Without doing any damage. Yeah, long time. You know, a few hundred quid for a new piece of PPF on the bonnet. And effectively, you're back to square one. So there's uh, a real intrinsic value. You can see where the demand comes for it. Um, when it comes to applying it, obviously we don't need a how-to guide because it's not something PPF, though small areas like piano trim, potentially you could buy off cuts and apply it yourself at home. It's not that Actually, difficult. small areas like that are really, really <laughs> tricky to do. <laughs> there's, like a, there's like a middle ground with it. Like uh, this area here yeah. on this McLaren, that size piece is actually really nice to apply. Bigger areas have their own tricks and the, the different films actually have lots of different tricks because the adhesives are different. But so in terms of the process, you get a car in, Sunshine calls you up and says, oh, I've got McLaren 570S yep. and I want it PPF. So yep. your first step is going to be, I imagine, to get, do you get the pre-cut template or do you cut it on your own plotter? How does it work for you? Um, for me, yeah, I, buy the, I haven't quite got a plotter yet. So we get pre-cut templates. Mm -hmm. It's irrelevant whether or not you've got a plotter really. So you... The Americans like to what they call bulk stuff, which is having a roll of it mm. um, and fitting it to a panel and then bit, but much more yeah. like wrapping. Exactly, yeah. Um, that is, I think they term, I think that's now termed like a custom install. Mm -hmm. um, that is a highly skilled process yeah. in the same way that wrapping a car that way, if uh, it's done by... Uh, I'm trying to say this in a in a positive way, but it's difficult. <laughs> if if you get a cheap job done, yeah. you could expect to have cut marks on the car, marks in the paint, and everything else. And it's the same with bulk installation. So nine times out of ten, you want to install from a kit. There is a very small percentage of highly highly skilled guys, mainly in the U.S., that can mm. bulk install, and you would honestly not know. And they're taking glass out, taking lights out, taking panels off. Taking it to the top level. Yeah. Very, very much so. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. In there, to, 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 I'm great. To, to talking us. off the point. So, so, to get, to back on, so you've got your templates through the post. Okay. They've arrived. Your McLaren has arrived. So yeah, pre-cut kits. Yep. And the preparation process is very. This is why it's great for detailers. The prep process, like painting your fence in a way. Um, a lot of the success of the job is in the prep. Yeah. So and it's exactly the same as detailing. It needs to be properly clean. It needs to be, the surface needs to be decontaminated really well and a machine polish underneath helps a lot as well. Um, so again, a lot of new cars they're delivered, they still will have marks on them. There are some companies that are getting better and better, but most of them still do, even you know, really good cars. Um, so you get those out because obviously once it's under the film, you can't correct them. So if you've got a swirl that you can see, exactly. that, get rid of it. Same as and of actually it's a bit of a, we can myth bust a little bit here. The modern high-end self-healing films mm -hmm. actually fill swirls really well. You, you'd be amazed. You can put them on a very, very swirled panel and not see a single swirl. That's amazing. Um, they are incredible with what they can do. Um, I mean, they'll, they'll, if you put gloss PPF on a matte panel, it'll turn it gloss. So yeah. a couple of swirls disappear. So the machine polishing is more to do with making sure that you're back to bare paint okay so it's a and making polishing. sure there's no um you know on the lighter end no silicones and no oils but on the heavier end has it had a dealer applied ceramic have they put not even a you know a polymer sealant mm. is there some sort of thing well, because they're not just because then it won't stick yeah. Yeah. so you know, the mo one of the most important jobs you've got to do as, a, as an installer is make sure that it's going to stick. So uh, I would say it's more important to machine polish beforehand from that point of view than from a getting rid of swirls point of view. Gotcha. And then when it comes to the actual application, um, I've seen it done in various ways. I mean, it's all pretty much the same, but do you use quite a lot of water? And, and, and yeah, I always say it's kind of the... It's like the middle ground between window tinting and wrapping. Mm -hmm. So window tinting is wet, um, 
it, and, it, and it's, it's probably similar to window tinting except you're obviously not doing a flat panel. So wet, you're doing a, a wet application. So basically you float it about on water and then it's all about squeegeeing out the so water. So you spray it with the water and panel, spray a bit onto the, the, yeah. pan, the sheet, you lay it on and then it's about pulling out all that water. Which it's about squeegeeing out and there's, there's definitely an art form to managing, you know, it's a 3D shape. So mm -hmm. there's an art form to managing how you get rid of that water. So you can't push water uphill. So, you, but you, you naturally might want to. So there's a, a big part of the learning process is in where do you push the water to, and how, especially on a lot of modern cars, a lot of contours and creases and stuff. You have to think about where you take the water and how you get it out from under the film. Well, I remember you saying we were talking about this earlier. In fact, we talked about this a couple of years ago as well, um, and saying how uh, with PPF, it's you can do your course, so to speak, and you can get some practice, and you get up to a level where you're competent. But there is actually like a super level, so to speak, beyond that, where actually to be really good at it takes is really difficult. So it's, if you're if you're a good detailer, you can get up to the PPF level, the yep. skills are there. But to get that level up takes some time. You're saying how you realise now you've you've kind of developed those skills and you're feeling kind of much more in control of it. Um, whereas before, you know, it's always hard work and it's quite nerve wracking and stuff like that. Yeah, hundred percent. And it, you know, I would definitely say this is like an advice to our listeners type yeah. thing. You know. Uh, if you're thinking about getting into PPF, um, get some samples, have a play with it, chat to, you know, this is like the due diligence thing yeah. we spoke about again. Um, phone up a load of guys that are doing PPF and that have done it for a while because it's expensive to get trained in. And anyone, any one of those companies or any one of those guys doing it, they will tell you you probably will not make profit on PPF jobs for one to two years. Um, and that's because of the amount of stuff that you have to redo you will, and mess around with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You will, um, the, it's hard, it's, yeah. it, it's hard to do right. Um, especially as detailers, we've got an even pickier eye. And you know, I mentioned to you earlier, I think the standard of PPF is, you know, really, we're seeing more and more detailers doing it. And if, if you're able to do it well, we're actually now sort of know, leading, the way. leading, showing the manufacturers how well it can be done. We were talking about how, as an industry, detailing kind of emerged out of uh, paint shop work, out of classic car restoration work and stuff like that. And we were kind of, not a poor relation, but we kind of emerged from it. And that now, um, if you look at the machines, the compounds, the pads that a detailer is using and the finish they're aiming for, it's much higher than typical body shops and environments like that. So in a way, we've overtaken those that have, have kind of started it. And in the same token of PPF, obviously in the early days, it was small areas to protect certain things. Now, um, and I remember you were saying how one manufacturer was saying to you, you, can, you won't notice it from two foot. But now as a detailer, you're saying, well, actually, uh, we think we can do better than that. And the PPF has come out, the new selfie and coatings, uh, and the development has been driven so that now some of them are nearly invisible. Um, you, you know, and I'm, I, I will openly admit, I'm not that you need a, a mega facility to, to, to get there. I've seen some PPF installs that are mind-blowingly good. Mm. Like you, and I know there are guys out there, um, Mr. Glass Hooper, um, there are guys out there who have pulled out screens, pulled out lights. You know, we're getting to that level now where those sorts of things are possible with PPF. Mm -hmm. um, and if you get a super clean install um, in the right conditions, it, it's really hard to spot. Yeah. Um, and then you've got this lovely self-healing element to it as well. Element mm -hmm. over the top, which you know, like any self-healing, it's not infallible, but you know, it certainly helps. So, I mean, what's interesting in the self-healing you mentioned, there was a uh, sort of Infinity slash Nissan bought out self-healing clear coat. And a couple it's been around for years, hasn't it? Yeah. On and off, yeah. And what I'm, all I'm thinking is, from, a, from, a, a, from the future point of view, um, do you think, where do you think PPF's going to go? Do you think it's going to start being an option for manufacturer and they do it at the factory? Or, I mean, that would be a hell of a risk for detailers. No, I think it's like, deta it's like detailing is a process, isn't it? Like ceramic coating, like everyone says, mm. Why don't why aren't cars ceramic coated from the factory? Mm. You know they they just it's such a labour intensive process. Um, I can certainly see that dealers would add it, and we're seeing this already. Do, aren't, yeah. You know dealers all over the country. Um, you know we all love talking about the industry, but one of the things detailers should be aware of is every high end 
car dealer I can think of, the local Ferrari dealer, the local Porsche dealer, the local McLaren dealer, the local Bentley dealer, ha are all setting up PPF bays and they're all setting up detailing bays. Actually in the dealership. Actually well. in the dealership yeah. because this work has a place. It's not at the manufacturer level. There's no way when these things come off the line they're going to get PPF straight away. They're, they're just not. Um, and in terms of one question I see quite often is somebody's just bought a new car. Uh, now sometimes, bear in mind, when you bought a new car, depending on the type of car, if it's particularly if it's from, say, America or Japan, it wasn't built the day before you collected it. You know, it wasn't straight off the construction line. There you go, sir. Even you know, if it was built in the UK. Yeah, quite well, quite. And so, you know, it's been on a low loader. It's been on a possibly a boat, possibly a train. Um, so it's lived. So that paint has what we call outgassing. Um, or it's had a chance to properly cure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we get a lot of questions uh, saying, look, my car's just been, say you've had a, a ding and it's just been resprayed or partially resprayed. With PPF, how long do you need to wait between the car being sprayed and applying a PPF or indeed any other coating like ceramics? This is a question I love actually because there's a lot of, even in the wax days, we used to get this a lot. The answer is a lot lower than you think. I think this is one of those things where with experience, you realise it's a lot different to theoretically what you'd think. Okay. In theoretically what you'd think is it needs to outgas, the solvents need to leave, you need to wind back a little bit more for that as well. So this is one of those answers that's based, so how do things cure? Yes. So historically paint cured because it was a chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. So it was a solvent based paint, you mixed stuff together like it was mixing epoxy resin. You mix two bits together when they're mixed there's a chemical reaction and then there's a chemical curing. Paint isn't like that now. Paint now cures by evaporation. So, so that's a big difference with when people say water-based paints. Because again, the, the, the history of paint, a lot of people get confused. We've got some nitrocellulose came out in 23, you've got various enamels, then you've got acrylic lacquers mm -hmm. and acrylic enamel, and all of these different bits. So it, I think it's one probably ought to put this answer in the bracket of the right sort of paint type. Yeah, 100%. And let's not forget, probably if we're charting the rise of PPF and the rise of ceramic coatings, part of that is due to the fact that the vehicle paint is now massively different to, to, to how it was even five years ago. Mm. It's been legislated against, you mentioned water base, let's not forget it's the colour layer and the primer layers yeah, of water base. The lack is still, clear yeah. is still solvent based and clear. It's because it, in the old days they had isocyanate which was a bit, it's not great for your lungs and stuff yeah. and I believe now they're trying to find alternatives for it. But the, I'm not a chemist and, and don't know so somebody on here is probably n knows much more and if you do get in touch let's talk because I want to <laughs> know honestly I, yeah. I, I don't think you can educate yourself enough about the I, I was doing a training course for Rupes at the ultimate finish last week. And I said to the guys there, go and educate yourselves about automotive yeah. paint. You can Google it. So go and, you know, every detailer has probably worked on a brand new Mazda, put a paint gauge on it, had a heart attack because it <laughs> read 50 something. That doesn't mean there's no clear coat, guys. What that means is the substrate, so colour layers, are, oh, thin, yeah. are a lot thinner than they were now. So actually the clear coat, because if you think about it, the clear coat layer is the protective layer exactly. on paint. That's maybe gone from... 30 to 40 microns to 25 to 30 microns doesn't mean you can't polish the car. So, but go and educate yourself on that stuff mm. because Mazda, go on the Mazda website, they've got pages and pages and pages about their paint system. Um, and it is, it's important to go out and just learn things. Paint has changed massively in the last five or six years it just. What I would say, and it's kind of a slight analogy, is I used to, I did these presentations at the Practical Classics NEC show up in front of people and oh, yeah. on the history of paint. And so obviously in properly planned, six months before, you start phoning up DuPont and all the different paint companies and get a really good verdict thing. Or you do what I did, and then suddenly realise and see it in the calendar five days before panic, hit Google. Um, and the amount of evidence, in the end I called some people who knew all their stuff and so I was able to filter out the stuff that wasn't true, but actually have a, not a cynical eye, but a, uh, a critical eye, should we say, when, when researching things, because um, a lot of the information online was actually um, not entirely true or not ex exactly phrased properly. So Anything you read on the internet, of course, as well, can be biased with marketing. So it is, yeah. read between the marketing stuff to get to the fact. It's, there are some fact based in there, but you, you know, you'll see it's, it, it's changed massively. And I think yeah. that's part of the reason more damage happens to cars now. And, and, because paint is undeniably thinner. Yeah. So, you know, and that's going to chip more, even if it's the same stuff and it's not the same stuff even. So, so going back to the original question from about a year ago, <laughs> um, 
how long, if your car's just been painted, would it? Oh, yeah, would you question. wait no, until? No, the... no, no amount of time at all. Because, so um, I know for a fact. So, G-Technic, So, from a coatings point of view, G-Technic openly state their coatings are permeable, so their coatings will let gas out through them. Mm -hmm. So you can coat something straight away. It's not going to trap moisture. Um, and it's the same with PPF. PPF is, is gas permeable, so it, okay. it doesn't trap stuff underneath it. So it will let stuff go through it. In all reality, you would wait a day or two, mm -hmm. but you know, all of these things, I'm not a painter, so again, if you are a painter, comment and let us know more information, because the more information we can share on mm -hmm. this stuff, the better. But the stuff is, you know, the stuff gets polished as soon as it come off, comes That's off true. the line, doesn't it? Well, well, aside from, say, outgetting, there's another thing of hardness. I mean, don't they get harder and harder over They time? do, but it's in a period of, like, 24 to 48 hours. Okay. The 48 hours to three weeks mark, I think there's very little change these days. Go back 10, 12, 15 years, there was a big change then, because we were then into solvent reaction, mm. and that's temperature dependent. So if we were in December and we had a cold December, yes, it could take a month. For, the, for that chemical reaction to occur. Mm -hmm. But now it's more about evaporation and it's, it's got to be more controlled because the whole car manufacturing process yeah. is much more controlled. Um, and actually, you know, e even you guys that have got a new car and have watched it, you know, you can watch your car now when it's being built so you can see when they've made stuff and see when it's left the factory and see where it is on the transit route. It still takes like two weeks to get to a, even if it's made in Europe. Yeah. It still takes like two weeks to get to the dealer. They've got to then PDI it, so it's you know. It's never you're not going to get it fresh off fresh off the. Uh, In eleven years of detailing, mm -hmm. I've never put something on top of paint, and then there's been a reaction. Yeah. So uh, yeah. that works. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we shall wrap it up there. Thank you oh, very okay. much for yeah. watching, no uh, and James, thank you for taking the time. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, we will show you more soon, and we'll do some more stuff with James in the future. I am sure. Thank you. <laughs>